it's certainly good for a lot of reasons to be here this morning. As we come and gather before the very God that we serve. As we know that He sees our worship. And we know He knows what we do and what we don't do. Whether our heart is truly into our worship or not. He knows that. That's why we can never feign true worship. And worship must come from the heart. As the Bible directs us to I want to echo the statement that was read by the card that we are so thankful for the love and the outpouring of, of good things and help in the time of, of our sorrow. And I know that's, that's very meaningful in times like this. This morning I want to talk about what the Lord's Supper teaches us. And I was thinking about, as I was thinking about what to talk about, it's been a long time we really talked about lesson just on the Lord's Supper. I can't remember, I guess maybe it was 2017, the last time I dedicated a full lesson on the Lord's Supper. And so I want to do that this morning. As we think about what we just have performed in our worship as far as the taking of the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. As our mind was focused upon the cross and what Jesus did on Mount Calvary. A long time ago, it seems that we look back a couple thousand years in the history where Jesus died on the cross on 33 AD. Mark chapter 14, verses 22 to 25. And as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup and he had given thanks and gave it to them. And they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for me. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Those words are about the future of the church. And I think we understand Jesus talking about us today. That Jesus is a part of what we're doing. We're communing with him when we take up the Lord's Supper. And we'll talk more about that in the lesson. But I also want you to think about it. Jesus was teaching them what the purpose of the unleavened bread was for. It was his body, represents his body. And the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that would be shed on the cross. Those have some meaning. That's what the memorial really does. It shows us it has meaning for us today. And it teaches us some lessons. First of all, I'm going to talk about on the board is it teaches us the awfulness of sin. How bad sin really is. As people today in the world, they will blow off sin. and think, well, it's just a trivial thing. It's not something to worry about. And they'll even laugh and joke about it. The book of Proverbs even tells us that that fools make a sport, make light of sin. And so we should never do that. It, one of the things the Lord's Supper, we take of that every first day that we are reminded of the fact God sacrificed His Son on the account of my sins and your sins as well. It sins in the whole world. And God taught the Jews to sacrifice for sin. That's really the meaning of the Old Testament. You may think, why did they offer all those bulls and the goats? And why did they give the life of that animal? Take your Bible to Leviticus chapter 22. We find the sacrifices there. I want us to be impressed with what they had to do. And I'm so glad you and I today don't have to, to have animals take to worship and have to sacrifice those on the occasions that were necessary for that. Because it was truly a, in a lot of ways, a very bloody sacrifice. As we look at Leviticus chapter 22, verse 18 beginning tells us, Speak to Aaron and to his sons and to all the sons of Israel and say to them, Any man of the house of Israel is of, or of the aliens in Israel who presents his offering, whether it is any of their votive or any of their free will offerings which they present to the Lord for a, a burnt offering. For you to be accepted, it must be a male without defect from the cattle, the sheep, or the goats. Whatever it has a defect, you shall not offer it, for it will not be accepted for you. When a man offers a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord to fulfill the special vow or a free will offering of the herd of the flock, 
It must be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no defect in it. And those that are blind or, or fractured or maimed or having a running sore, estimate or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord, nor make any of them an offering by fire on the altar to the Lord. Now you see, in some respects, God's saying these have to be perfect sacrifices. You know, that's the shadow of what we realize what the very perfect Son of God was that last sacrifice. All leading up, all the rivers of blood that were shed uh, by the Israelites of all the animals throughout all the years of sacrifice. And there were many. We realize it all leads to what we have today in the church. In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, it mentions there, it says, here the Hebrew writer says, Now when these things have been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services, but into the second part the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood. In other words, he always had to have blood with him, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in it. And so you see again, that was a time when blood was shed, the animals were killed, and, the, and the, all that was taking place because God was saying, sin has consequences. Sin takes the life. It takes a life given a sacrifice for your sins and for my sins. Now, we didn't live under the Old Testament. We live under the New Testament where the last sacrifice has already been given at the cross. At Mount Calvary, Jesus gave his life for us. And he gave his life for our redemption. Matthew 26, verse 28 tells us, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. If you notice in Mark, Mark doesn't say the exact purpose. It says it's shed for many. And it stops there. But Matthew's account, he tells us exactly why. The purpose, the word for there introduces the purpose unto or for in order to have the remission of sins. And that's exactly what you and I have because Jesus went to the cross. He's willing to go. Why was that? Because Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. You may ask, why did God require that? Why did God say, well, I have to send my son in the first place? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. He loved us. Couldn't he have saved us any other way? Well, that was a way of sacrifice, wasn't it? It took a great sacrifice for God the Father to send Jesus to come to die for us. And Jesus knew full well why he was going to this earth to die for us. To give his life a ransom for us. That he could only pay what you and I could not pay. And that's what the, the Lord's Supper reminds us. It had to be because sin is that awful a deed. Awful a, a thing that we do that's not trivial. It's, it's something that once we do, we become a sinner because of our sins. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, as Romans chapter 3, 23 tells us. You and I are bought with a price. And that's one of the teachings of Scripture. Is the fact that when you become a child of God, you're bought by the blood that Jesus gave on that cross of Calvary. First Corinthians 6, verse 20. Paul actually says that. He says, For you, actually, verse 19 says, You're not your own, but you have been bought at a price. Verse 20. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You know, some might say, well, that's a terrible thing to have to be owned by some. But it's a wonderful thing because God owns us. We have traded masters, if you will. To have the devil as your master is a terrible thing. That truly really would be a terrible thing. But to have God as the one who owns us is a wonderful thing because he loves us. As we often say, the devil doesn't care about us. He wants to destroy us. God wants to save us and keep us from the awfulness of sin. That's really what, why he did what he did at the cross for Calvary. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. 
Peter reminds us again. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That goes back to what we read in Leviticus chapter 22. Isn't it? it shows us the very fact that God had to send a perfect sacrifice. The only one that could do that was Jesus, who lived a life who knew no sin, neither was God found in his mouth, as the Bible tells us. And in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 to 15, notice again what the Hebrew writer tells us. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this creation. Now, before I go on, the Hebrew writer is comparing and contrasting the old law and what we have with the new covenant today. And he's talking about why we have better things, better promises, better conditions, better grace and forgiveness. Verse 12, he's going to say, And not through the blood of bulls and calves, but through his own blood, called by Jesus, <coughs> He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason, he is the mediator of a, of a new covenant. So that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Now I read verse 15 to say this. The reason why we get to go to heaven, the reason why we can say that sin is no longer something that can conquer us, something that condemns us, is because of what Jesus did. And we're reminded that every time we take the Lord's Supper, we're reminded of what God gave for us. That's why it can never be a trivial thing to us. That's why we can't say, you know, it, it, it's something my sins don't bother because it cost God His Son. He gave His good Son for us. And another thing the Lord's Supper teaches us, it teaches us to proclaim the Lord's death to others. The thing about what the gospel is talking about, really, as Paul talks about the facts of the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, he talks about there, the very core of the gospel is what Jesus did at the cross of Calvary. Paul says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which I also received, in which you also stand, by which you are also are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, Unless you believed in vain, for I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Whenever we take the Lord's Supper, we know our mind goes back to the cross. Our mind goes back thousands of years, hundreds and thousands of years to the to the cross where Jesus died. And I know pictures, they don't really do justice to what. You know, my, by the eye of faith, I look at that and say, you know, this is what you and I remember. You know, sometimes, maybe it may be well not to even have pictures up because we understand what crucifixion was about. But we're reminded of that. People are reminded of the fact that Jesus suffered a great deal, an excruciating death. And one of the things about that is, back then it was a shame. Back then it was a sense of, of, of shame to be saying, well, that person was crucified. It had a stigmatism with it. But today we look at the cross a little differently. And the cross, in some sense, we have, and we glory in the cross. Like Paul said he would glory in the infirmities and of the cross of, of Christ. We go preach the gospel. We talk about a crucified Savior. 
And some might think, well, that's a, you know, that might be a paradox in itself. The fact that someone's going to save you, but they died on the cross. Remember what they said to Jesus while he was on the cross? Those ones who were mocking him said, he saved others, let him save himself. Well, that's exactly what they said. They were taunting him in some way. But that's exactly what you and I preach. We preach about a crucified Savior. A Savior that willingly died for you and I. So we didn't have to die on the cross. And when Philip was preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, he ran to him and he heard him preaching, or actually reading of the, the prophet Isaiah. In verse 30 he said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And then by the filth to come up and sit with him. Now the passage which the reading was this. Like a lamb, he was led to the slaughter room. Like a lamb before it shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied to him. Who could describe a generation where he was taken, his life was taken away from the earth? And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. That's how we can get in conversation with people even today about Jesus. There's times when it's on people's minds about the death of Jesus. And every first day of the week we remember that, don't we? There's times when people may ask, well, did Jesus really die? And we're going to talk about the scriptures, how the Old Testament talks about Jesus doing what he did at the cross. And that's exactly what Philip did on this occasion. He preached Christ to this Ethiopian eunuch. And then he was baptized. The Bible tells us he came to some water and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And Paul preached about the death of Jesus as well. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. Paul says, that's exactly what my topic was. When I came to Corinth, he said, for I determined not to know anything among you. Who was he talking to? Again, the Corinthians. What was he saying to them? We determined not to know anything but except Jesus Christ and him crucified. You know, that was a topic, wasn't it? It would talk to people who maybe have never heard who Jesus was. Say, so, you know, this person died for you, and that you could give your life to him. And at, at times, got Jesus, or actually got Paul in trouble for that in Acts chapter 26. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 26, time when Paul, again, is preaching, verse 19, beginning, talks about there, to King Agrippa. He said, so King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. But kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea, even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. For the same reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day, stand to this day, testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets of Moses was going to take place that the Christ was to suffer and by, that by reason of his resurrection from the dead he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. On this occasion he took the opportunity to talk to King Agrippa who needed to also hear this message about the crucified Savior. And we as Christians, all Christians, yes, I should say, proclaim Christ's death until he comes by partaking of the fruit of the vine and the bread. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we often read this passage. We're about ready to have the Lord's Supper. There's times when I would read this uh, as I was presiding on the Lord's Supper. Here Paul says, For I received from the Lord which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the, on the night which he was betrayed took bread. When I give him thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is, is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. This 
as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This last part, look at this. It says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Right now, what we do honors God and honors Christ, but also proclaims the fact that he died for us, that his blood was shed for all of humanity. You know, the Christians of the first century, they, a lot of ways they were mocked and maligned because of their partaking of the supper. They were called cannibals because they take the flesh of a man and drink his blood, and not knowing that it was just symbolic of that. It's not little blood and body that they would eat and drink. Just like we don't do today. We take what represents that as a memorial to the very death of Christ. You know, the very fact that we're still doing that today, hundreds of years since Christ died on the cross, that shows us his death is still being proclaimed today like it was in the first century. And then also, the Lord's Supper teaches us to value our life in Christ's kingdom. Going back to Mark, you know, I will mention the fact that Mark says Jesus will not partake of it again until it's the kingdom of God. You know, the kingdom was established on Pentecost. I know there's a lot of disagreement about that. So the, some say there's a future kingdom to be established later on that Christ wanted to establish a kingdom but was not able to. But in Acts chapter 2, that church that Jesus promised to build is the very kingdom that we understand. Matthew chapter 16, 18 bears that out. It says, here when Jesus said, I, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. You know, all the parables that Jesus gave about what the kingdom would be like when it is a part of the earth. And all the things that he said about the kingdom and the coming kingdom. That was all not for nothing. All the parables and things that Jesus said about the kingdom are for what we have today. There's not a church age and a kingdom age later on. We'll talk more about that in other lessons. But we need to value our life in the kingdom today. How do we know that we're in the kingdom? Because the Colossians were translated, when they obeyed the gospel, they were translated into that very kingdom that Jesus said he would build. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, for he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. Your translation may have. The kingdom is of his own son or his beloved son somewhat. Jesus has a kingdom today. He's a king who has a kingdom. You and I can be a part of that. That's why we take the Lord's Supper in the kingdom today. Revelation 1 verse 9, John even says, says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus it was on the island called Patmos, on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. John was suffering. He was in exile then. He knew what tribulation was about then. We also knew about the kingdom. And they preached the kingdom, didn't they? In the first century as well. Remember what John the Baptist and Jesus both said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Lord's Supper is our time to be with Christ. Mark 14, 25, like I said. That bears that out, doesn't it? Jesus said, Truly I say to you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now, what time is that? As we know, when Jesus comes back, that's when the Lord's Supper is going to end. And we no more need to remember the death of Jesus because we're going to see Jesus. We're going to be with Jesus. Right now is that time drinking and eating the Lord's Supper in the kingdom of God today. It is a time of fellowship with Christ. That's part of that. As we value the kingdom today, do we not value the time that we spend with Christ? That's something that 
I know sometimes people miss services on account of sickness or, or health or some other reasons where they're hindered from being here. What about if we miss the time of communion with Christ? We're missing fellowship with Christ. You only get close to God. Come and take the Lord's Supper. Be a part of that. First Corinthians 10 16 tells us this. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? That means it's, it's actually talking about a, a fellowship, if you will. It's a communion where we partake of what happened back then. And I think God knows exactly what we're doing when we do that. There's that sharing that goes on there. Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ, Paul says. So again, there's all this connection we have to Jesus because of what he did and also because of the memorial that we take every first day of the week. And also, the Lord's Supper teaches us to be ever thankful for Jesus' sacrifice. We talked about Thanksgiving this last Thursday about Thanksgiving and and what happened back then? We're, we're thankful for a free country. We're thankful for our family and our friends. We're thankful for the blessings that this, this country, America, has enjoyed. But most importantly, we're thankful for what Jesus did. That's really to the Christian what Thanksgiving is all about. As far as in everyday Thanksgiving. And I believe in every first day of the week, Thanksgiving, as we think about uh, the first day of the week, the death of Jesus. Well, how do we show thankfulness for Jesus' death? Well, first of all, I would say the coming, and every time the doors of the church are open, you be here that you possibly can because you love the Lord. And you want to be there every first day of the week to take the Lord's Supper, to be with Him in that way as well. But I also want to say this, as I was preparing this lesson, thinking about going back to this idea of showing the worth. You know, the Greeks actually had a word for this, the idea of giving weight to something. The more weight was, the more important it was. What you and I need to do is to give more worth, more weight to the things that we do on the first day of the week, like taking the Lord's Supper. Does that mean something to us? Or is it little to us? That's really the big point. Is the big question is. The word we give to his sacrifice shows thankfulness. First Corinthians chapter 11. Going back to that again. Therefore whoever eats the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord. In an unworthy manner. Now I read a lot of articles about this idea of unworthiness. And I understand what it means. It's not talking about the fact that we're not worthy because of us ourselves. We're not worthy of God's grace and His mercy and all that taking the Lord's Supper itself. It's talking about the manner in which we take it. Is it just like taking just a common meal? Like going out to a restaurant eating the food we have that has no significance. You know, when I go to a restaurant and eat or, or, or even at house where we make dinners like that, that turkey we had just last Thursday. That's just simply a meal. It doesn't have any meaning other than just feeding the belly, the physical side. The Lord's Supper has a special meaning to it. Because we're thinking about the cross. We're thinking about the blood and the body that was given. And that's really what the crux of what Paul is talking about here. If you take it in an unworthy manner, in other words, you just put it in your mouth, drink the cup without ever even thinking about the Lord. That would probably be a good definition of an unworthy manner. And Paul says, person does that should be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, but let man examine himself. In other words, you pay attention to what you're doing. You examine yourself. Am I doing this? Thinking about Jesus. Am I just going through the motions? Because we do it every Sunday. Sometimes people say it gets so cold because, and, and so it, and it's so formal because we take it every first day of the week. Not if we put our heart and our mind into it. <clears throat> And so he goes on to say, but let him examine himself. And so, and so doing, he is to eat the, of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks, judges to himself. If he does not judge the body right. I think I, I took 
I get the translation, I think it was the ESV. Though. To bring, bring out the point, the fact it's not the person that's unworthy, because we're all unworthy. That's a matter of grace that God even gave His Son in the first place. No one's worthy for that. But it's how we take the Lord's Supper that really matters. If I'm thinking about the Lord's death, I'm giving weight to that sacrifice. I'm being thankful to you for that as well. We are blessed to start out each week being thankful to Jesus. As I mentioned, sometimes people say, you know, y'all take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Sometimes people have a hard time understanding. Don't they get old? Well, saying I love you to your wife might get old if you don't put your heart into it. If you don't feel what you feel. Or, or doing other things. You know, they gave the sacrifices of the Sabbath. They remembered the Sabbath every Saturday in the Old Testament. Did that not get old? Some might argue the question there. No, to me, and this is just me, I truly think we're blessed. That every first day of the week, we start out our week in a great way by remembering the death of Jesus. And that gets us started right. Putting our perspective where it needs to be. Reminding ourselves who gave his life that we could be free from our sins. That should mean a lot to us. And to start out your week every week like that, I believe that's a blessing that you and I have to enjoy. In Acts 20 verse 7, the Bible says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. That doesn't say which first day of the week. It just says on the first day of the week. So it is a weekly observance. Paul, ready to depart on the next day, spoke to them and continued his message to, until midnight. And the last verse of the lesson is this. Are we thankful for what Jesus did? We have a victory. You know, 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about the resurrection, the victory, the fact that we can, can be, you might say, resurrected in victory because of what Jesus did. And because we can be victorious over death. That's why Paul says about how the Christian doesn't have to worry about that. Because God will raise us. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where victory is. If you've never put on Christ, are you thankful for what he did? You know, you'll never understand the Lord's Supper until you actually are able to be thankful for what Jesus did in saving you from your sins. You didn't come out of your sins to fully appreciate the Lord's Supper and to rightfully take the Lord's Supper. We have to be followers of Jesus. You put on Christ. But how do you put on Christ? It's by faith. It starts out by faith. The Bible says, Without faith is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is the Lord of those who diligently seek Him. We repent of all of our sins. Acts 2, verse 38, they were told, Repent and be baptized. Well, why be baptized? Well, to put on Christ. Galatians 3, verse 27. Well, do I not confess Christ? Well, also Jesus said to, to confess Him before men. Paul said it's unto salvation, Romans 10, verse 10. You're subject to God's invitation call this morning. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Why don't you do now what you know will save you out of what Christ can save you? As together we stand and we sing, the psalm has been selected.